Good morning, everyone, and welcome to August, a month which can bring incredible bounty in the garden, but can also bring with it extreme heat, drought, pest and disease pressure, and just about every other stressor known to plant kind. Stressed plants won't yield as well as healthy plants, and the produce that we do get often doesn't taste as good. Stressed plants are also more susceptible to damage from insects and disease pressure. So what's a gardener to do? The good news is there are a few tactics we can focus on this time of year to ensure that our plants are as happy, healthy, and stress-free as possible. The first and probably most obvious stressor for plants this time of year is water, both not enough and too much. Too much water can lead to wilting and leaf drop. And unfortunately, since too little water can cause plants to exhibit the same symptoms, folks often confuse the two. Too much water may also lead plants to facilitate more of their resources towards growth and less toward defense. Clearly, growth is not a bad thing, but it's a very delicate balance that plants have to strike in order to stay healthy. Too much water can also lead to conditions like root rot. It can leach nutrients out of the soil and inhibit nutrient uptake by plant roots. Many a good intentioned gardener has accidentally overwatered their plants, assuming that in the heat of summer, their plants need more and more and more water. Now like too much water, too little water can also cause wilting and leaf drop. But keep in mind, some large leaved plants like winter squash and pumpkins will naturally droop in the heat of the day to reduce water loss from their large flat leaves. If your plants perk back up as the day cools off, that is likely what is going on and they don't necessarily need more water. But if your plants appear droopy and wilted and don't seem to recover, this can definitely be a sign that they need water. It can also be a sign of certain diseases. Insufficient water can also reduce nutrient uptake in plants, stunt growth, and reduce yields. Now that nutrient uptake piece is very important. If you're using fertilizers that are applied into the soil and move to the plant via uptake through the roots, as I mentioned, both too much water and insufficient water can cause problems. You kind of have to strike a really good balance of soil moisture to get really effective nutrient uptake. Now, if you are unsure about soil moisture levels in your own garden soil, it's always best to check before you just go out and start watering everything. You can use a soil moisture meter or just the finger test. You stick a finger into the soil about two to three inches deep, and if it feels dry, it's time to water. That's really rudimentary, but it's a good starting point. A soil probe can also be helpful in checking soil moisture deeper in the soil. I have this soil probe on hand for gathering soil samples for lab testing, but it works well to sample soil moisture as well. I can push this deeper into the soil, I go down to about six to eight inches for many of my mature annual plants. I could go deeper for things like mature trees or shrubs because I wanna test the soil moisture nearer to the root zone. I'll bring this probe up and give the soil in here the feel test, squeezing the soil in my hand to form a ball. Now, my Ohio soil is relatively clay rich and heavy. And if I've got the ideal amount of moisture in my soil, the soil will form a pliable ball, which will still easily ribbon out between my fingers. If it's too dry, it'll be like a brick. And if it's too wet, it's going to be very sticky and won't crumble or ribbon out at all. Now, depending on your soil type, the way your soil looks and your field test may vary from what mine looks like, but this site gives a very helpful visual reference of that soil field test with different soil types. Now, in my garden in August, I find that my big mature plantings this time of year, so things like my tomatoes, my peppers, eggplant, melons, do better with less frequent, deeper waterings. As by this point in their life cycle, these plants have deeper, more robust root systems that can pull moisture up from the soil more efficiently. But any newly sprouted seedlings or transplants that are out in the garden this time of year, I have to do much more frequent shallow waterings. And that is to keep those first couple of inches of the soil moist at all times. 
small seedlings have relatively small underdeveloped root systems that don't reach very deep into the soil surface. So it's important that I make that water available exactly where those root systems are pulling from. So what does that look like? For my big established plants that are in ground, that works out to me watering them maybe two to three times in a dry August. I know that number probably sounds low to a lot of folks, but keep in mind that my clay rich soil really, really holds on to moisture well. And I also utilize heavy mulching to keep soil moisture locked in. Now my raised beds or containers, I do water much more frequently. And for those newly emerged seedlings or transplants, I'm watering two to three times a week during August. This rate of watering is gonna vary a lot depending again on your soil type. For instance, folks with very sandy soil can sometimes be watering every other day, sometimes every day in a hot, dry August. Now to make the most of all that watering, be sure to add mulch to the mix. If you have followed along with my channel for any amount of time, I'm sure that I sound like a broken record, but seriously, keep that soil surface covered. Besides all of the other benefits it supplies, mulching well can help lock soil moisture in to help keep your soil from drying out so quickly in the heat of the day, and it can cool that soil temperature down slightly. Now, Keeping the soil moist and cool is always my challenge this time of year, but if for some reason you are having the opposite problem where you just have rain that won't stop, I do recommend holding off on putting mulch down until that soil has had a chance to dry out a little bit. Now another key for stress-free plants this time of year is ensuring that plants have access to the macro and micronutrients that they need for strong growth. A big healthy plant with a well-developed root system is going to be better able to take up nutrients. Conversely, a stressed plant may have a harder time uptaking nutrients even if they are available there in the soil. But it's always a balancing act. Too few nutrients, too many nutrients, both can be detrimental to plants. Getting a little heavy handed with the fertilizer, especially when nitrogen is in abundance, may facilitate more plant resources toward growth and less toward defense and fruit or tuber production. Too little and plants may be weak, lack vigor, and provide poor yields. And unfortunately, the negative effects of imbalanced nutrition are multiplied when plants have to also contend with environmental stressors such as extreme heat. With my main warm season crops here in Ohio, that quest to provide my plants with optimal nutrition began back in planting time, usually about the middle of May to the beginning of June. For more on how I approach nutrition and fertility in my garden, check out this video. But in general, I focus on soil health and also provide my plants with a dose of all natural granular fertilizer at transplant time or when seedlings are a few inches tall. And in general, that approach has worked really, really well for me. This season in Ohio was a different story. I got hit with a triple whammy, first with unseasonably hot and dry weather when it should have been cool and rainy, followed by weather which was cool and rainy when it should have been warm and sunny, paired with mole and chipmunk tunneling under my plants, which were reducing my plants' ability to uptake water and nutrients, paired with smoke haze from the Canadian wildfires, which actually slowed down photosynthesis and growth in my plants during a time of year when they would typically be growing with rapid pace. All of these factors together, and it was clear that my plants were very stressed out. From planting time in mid-May, for almost an entire month, many of my transplants just sat there. My peppers were so sad, my tomatoes didn't grow. It was clear that I was gonna need a little extra boost this year. So for the first time ever, I decided to try foliar feeding. In cases like this, where plants are stressed, whether it's from the weather, or from soil pH, which is imbalanced, or basically any other stressors that will inhibit the uptake of nutrients, foliar feeding can be a literal lifesaver. While in general, foliar feeding does have its limitations and does not replace the need for healthy, balanced soil, 
it can be quite effective at treating certain nutrient deficiencies, especially certain micronutrients, as some of these can be more quickly and easily absorbed through the foliage versus the roots. This was the first time I've ever used foliar feed and was a little overwhelmed at the number of options out there. I tried several different options, but the one that I found that really worked well for me was AgriGrow Ultra. Now this is an organic liquid prebiotic fertilizer derived from kelp, and it can be used as a foliar spray or as a watering, transplanting, or drenching solution. AgriGrow works by stimulating and feeding the soil's microbiology. One of the reasons I focus so much on soil health in my own garden is that certain microbes in the soil can form symbiotic relationships with plants, helping the plants to better uptake and absorb nutrients. AgriGrow supports and boosts these relationships. In fact, AgriGrow can help spike microbial activity very quickly, up to 5,000% in 72 hours. And this microbial boost can be seen typically for a month after application, depending on growing conditions. This boost in microbial activity can help plants in many ways, including better root development and plant structure, increased nutrient and water uptake, and boosted immune system function. In turn, the plants are more resistant to stress overall. This increased microbial activity also benefits the soil directly. It helps to improve soil structure, build humus, and speed up the breakdown of organic matter. If you've been with me for any amount of time, you've heard me talk at length about my clay-rich soil. Clay has its benefits, but it needs all the help it can get in terms of improving soil structure. Growing in heavy clay itself can actually be a stressor for many types of plants. So it's really nice to find a fertilizer that can help my plants and my soil at the same time. Now, I don't have a lab where I can test out the microbial boost in my own soil, though that would be really cool, but I can tell you that I've seen the difference in my plants. Once I started applying AgriGo Ultra and my plants started to take off and grow, they have looked happy and healthy this entire season so far. My yields have been tremendous. In fact, I'm struggling to keep, <laughs> to keep up with everything that I'm picking, which was not at all what I expected to happen given the way the season started this year. What I like about AgriGrow Ultra is that rather than just offering a quick fix or a Band-Aid, it's addressing the root of the issue. Pun absolutely intended. Now this time of year, in addition to those main season crops that are still going strong, I'm typically planting out my cool season veggies that will be ready for a fall harvest. So that includes things like my brassicas, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, um, leafy greens like kale and spinach, root crops like beets and carrots. But as you can imagine, they do not tolerate extreme heat. As stressful as that heat is for my tomatoes and my cucumbers, it's exponentially worse for my cool season, little baby transplants and seedlings that are just going out into the garden. I've started using the AgriGo Ultra on these plants as well. So for the things that are already out in the garden, I've got some peas and carrots and beets that are up. I'm using the foliar spray on them. And I'm really hoping that even though they are not well established yet, that will give them the little boost they need to get through these temperatures in the 90s right now. I'm also testing it out with my indoor seed starting. So using it as a seed soak and applying it to my indoor transplants that are growing. And I'm delaying planting where I can. So my broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kohlrabi, and kale are all still sitting in trays in the greenhouse. Typically, I would plant those out mid-August, but I'm holding off planting until those temperatures cool off just a smidge. But anything I can do to help mitigate stress on these little babies this time of year, I am doing. And in addition to helping them optimize their nutrient uptake, I'm focusing on heat and light exposure to the best that I can influence those factors. So if we're talking August in most parts of the United States, we're looking at temperatures which are too high and intense sunlight exposure versus the opposite problem, although cold can definitely stress out plants as well. It's important to note that extreme temperature swings can be much more stressful on plants 
than if it just stays a level hot temperature. Extreme heat can disrupt photosynthesis, reduce flower and fruit production. Many tomatoes, for example, with the exception of heat set varieties, will abort flowers after several days with temperatures above 85 degrees Fahrenheit and or nighttime temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Beans will abort flowers at temperatures over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Extreme heat can also affect pollination in cucurbits, things like cucumbers, melons, and squash. More male flowers than female are typically formed when temperatures are too high and plants are stressed, leading to fewer fruit, and flowers tend to close up more quickly when temps are high, increasing the incidence of incomplete pollination and thus malformed fruit. Direct intense sunlight can also cause sun scald in certain fruits and vegetables, including tomatoes, peppers, and melons. And while unfortunately we can't ask mother nature to turn on the air conditioning, there are a few things we can do to help plants out. Shade cloth may be one of the most obvious choices for giving our plants a break from intense heat and sunlight. Depending on the type you use, it can keep soil and air temperatures up to 10 degrees cooler. I've opted for 40% shade cloth, which works well for most plants, though you could go up to 60% for sensitive plants like lettuce and spinach. My shade cloths are well suited for rows at a six foot by 20 foot dimension. This size easily fits over the same hoops I use for insect netting. I prefer to use this suspended on the hoops versus floating the shade cloth over crops because it allows for optimal air circulation. This knit fabric also allows for better air movement and I can water right through the netting. Well, for optimal soil cooling benefits, combine the shade cloth with mulching your soil. Surround is another option for helping to mitigate the effects of heat and intense light on your plants. I talk about this product in detail in this video, but Surround is a kale and clay powder which is mixed with water, sprayed on plants, and dries to form a protective film, which amongst other benefits reduces canopy temperatures cooling plants by up to 10 to 15 degrees. It can also protect plants from sunburn and sun scald. Another option in areas where the spread of disease by overhead irrigation is not an issue, continually misting plants with sprinkler irrigation can help cool things down a bit. And one thing that I've tried to be more intentional about when planning and planting my garden is ensuring that my cool season crops are positioned to the east of taller main season crops. So whether that's a tall cover crop like this buckwheat, tall okra or sunflowers or corn, or blocked by vining crops that I've trained up a trellis, this allows these cool season plants a break from that intense afternoon sun as the day goes on. Then as those main season crops are coming down in mid-October after the first frost, it opens up the area and allows for more sunlight and warmth when these cool season crops actually need it. And a final big stressor this time of year, pests and diseases. And it's a vicious cycle. Insect feeding damage and disease pressure can cause plants to be stressed, but stressed plants are also more susceptible to insect feeding and disease pressure. Stress can suppress or weaken plants' immune response, making them less able to defend against pathogens or insect attacks. Additionally, specific types of insect pests are provided with growth and reproductive benefits by stressed plants. These include sucking insects, such as aphids and mites, and boring insects. Keep in mind that prevention is always the best cure. Making sure plants are healthy from the start is one of the best ways to help them fend off disease and insect pressure. Focusing on soil health, optimal nutrition, and choosing varieties that are best suited for your specific growing conditions are some of the best ways to do this. But if you're like me, you end up dealing with pests and diseases every year, no matter what you do. I use various methods to mitigate the effects of disease and insect stress on my plants. Some of these include using insect netting to provide a physical barrier between hungry critters and my plants. Surround, which I mentioned earlier, can also provide a physical barrier. I focus on proper plant nutrition and not feeding my plants in a way that will encourage too much foliar growth too fast. 
as this tends to result in really tasty, tender foliage that bugs just love. And again, I want to encourage as much microbial life in my soil as possible to boost overall plant health and nutrient uptake. I also always try to give my plants plenty of space to provide for adequate air circulation. Many diseases are exacerbated by our hot, humid conditions in August here in Ohio, and planting too tightly can just make things worse. I also try to mix plantings up in the garden as much as I can interplanting all different types of vegetables, herbs, and flowers to utilize the method of crop confusion to throw insect pests off. In this mix, I try to include plants which will encourage the presence of plenty of predatory insects. Predatory wasps in particular tend to love plants with tiny little flowers. Think things like bolted dill, cilantro, yarrow, and parsley. So those are the main tactics that I use to keep my plants happy, healthy, and stress-free in the heat of August. So be sure to drop a line in the comments below and let me know if you have any tactics that you use to mitigate the effects of stress in your garden. And if you found today's video helpful, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.